Okay, I think we're ready to start. I hope you enjoyed the beautiful breakfast. And good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, event that we are holding in connection with the uh, Statistical Commission 54th session of the UN Statistical Commission. My name is Francesca Perucci from the UN Statistics Division, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today <coughs> to this event that is jointly organized by us, the UN Statistics Division, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, UN Women, and UNITAR. So we will talk about citizen contribution to data. Uh, more broadly, we build on a conversation that has started already in uh, Bangkok a few months ago in uh, November 2022. It was the first attempt to bring together partners that were expressing interest on citizen data or its citizen contribution to data, partners that had already done work, especially from national statistical offices that had already tested some tools and civil society organizations. So in November, we started talking about what needed to be done and what a possible path to move ahead could be. That conversation continued and we had a very interesting uh, gathering of uh, experts just a few days ago on Friday, uh, before the commission started, what we call the Friday seminar. So the conversation continued there and we heard more experiences from countries that have done quite uh, a bit of work in this area contributions from partners who are interested in joining uh, the work, and uh, we learn a little bit their views. Uh, we had, of course, UN Women, World Bank, Paris 21, uh, GPSDD, Global Partnership. So we continue the conversation on how we can move forward. So today the idea is really to expand uh, the conversation and to gather more, more contributions from you, more suggestions on how we can move forward. But before we get into that, I would like to also mention the fact that yesterday we had a very interesting discussion at the former session of the Statistical Commission where member states gave us a mandate to proceed and they recognized the importance of citizen, citizens' contribution to data to fill data gaps, but also more importantly to make those uh, more difficult to measure groups of the population more visible in, uh, in our data, and, and overall to expand the, the role of citizens in, uh, in all the uh, different uh, uh, stages of the data value chain. So it was very important. That recognition for us, I think, is a very strong message. That means that national statistical offices are interested and willing, and they feel the need to move to, into that direction. But they also recognize the importance of developing a conceptual framework to move forward and eventually, you know, start building the normative work and the establishment of a collaborative uh, on citizen data. So today we're here uh, to expand and build on that conversation, but I think it's very important to know that we really have a mandate to move forward and that we can really work with civil society organizations, national statistical offices and the academia to build, to build this new field, relatively new field of work. So I also would like to mention the fact that this work is uh, uh, the result of a very extensive consultation and collaboration with other partners, and mainly it's the International Civil Center uh, and the Danish Institute for Human Rights. They've been the ones also approaching us, uh, the UN Statistics Division, and, and uh, uh, helping us navigate this, this, new, this new area of work. And then, of course, uh, I also want to thank Claire Melamed and, and the, all the colleagues and Karen Beth at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Uh, they're always with us when we start <laughs> something new. And, uh, so, and they're also graciously, graciously hosting the uh, event today. So I think that's enough from my side. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of the why we're here and what we're trying to do. Uh, but before I say more about the workshop, uh, my colleagues have prepared a Slido. Uh, I think you will see it here. So we have uh, the first question, why are we here so early in the morning when there are so many other side events of the commission? So why did you choose to show up? And uh, you have these options. You're passionate about the topic. You have no idea about what we're doing, but you want to learn more. 
you just follow your friends. <laughs> and there is free breakfast. <laughs> I think we're going towards that we are passionate about the topic. <laughs> so I think we, we are passionate about this topic. The problem is that uh, perhaps each one of us has a slightly different idea of what that means and how we want to see this field and this um, area of work uh, moving, right? So that's why I think it's very important to develop a conceptual framework and, and understand what has been done already in countries, what the various civil society organizations are doing, and start building that so that we can then have a way to work together and, and also to share experiences. And I think the collaborative will also help to that, to that um, uh, end in, in the sense that we'll be able to understand uh, our, our different experiences and learn from each other. <coughs> so we're setting a what? <laughs> okay, free breakfast also gets quite <laughs> So kudos to GPSCD, breakfast is good. <laughs> So just before I give the floor to my friend Claire, just to remind you the objectives of today's uh, gathering, today's event, is that we really want to try and demonstrate why engaging, uh, with in citizen, uh, why engaging citizens in data across all the stages of the value chain is important, but we also want to get inspired and, and build support for this new area of work and learn from you how you want to contribute and what you're doing and how you can help us. And then, of course, seek specific collaboration opportunities uh, with, with the different entities and the different agencies. So, uh, let me now invite Claire Melamed, who I'm sure everybody knows, <laughs> who's the CEO of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca, and thank you, everyone. I love that Slido, because I think it kind of incorporates, it sort of encapsulates everything that we, that we try to do together as a community. We're kind of bringing together those who are to allowing people who are passionate about an issue to find each other. We're learning from each other. We're creating communities of people who trust each other and know each other and are friends. And of course, we recognize the value of, uh, well, a free breakfast or lunch or dinner, depending on the time of day. Um, Thank you, thank you, Francesca. And I mean, I think, you know, never let anybody say that this community can't move fast. We heard that yesterday the mandate was passed in the Statistics Commission, and here we are all today ready to get started and, and do the work. So uh, if anyone tells you that this is a community that, uh, that, you know, that sometimes takes its time, you can remind them of this. Um, I mean, I think in, in the Global Partnership, we are we were always reminded, I think, by all of our many partners from all different sectors of the data community that ultimately all data comes from citizens. You know, that, that in some way or another, whether that's be through their responses to a survey or the things that they do which leave an impact on the planet, which is picked up by satellite imagery, or ultimately what we are doing as we, um, as we collect and analyze and use data is always it is receiving information from people and analyzing that to produce trends and to understand our lives and those of our fellow citizens better. And I think the exciting thing about this collaboration between the statistical community, civil society organizations around citizen-generated data is that we're really, it's really starting to see how the citizens themselves, the subjects of that data, can take more power, can take more control over how they're represented in data and really shift from being the kind of passive subjects of data where the, where the sort of what is important is defined by others to defining for themselves what is important and what data they want to be collected about themselves and have that discussion 
with statistics offices, um, with other data collection bodies to talk about, well, actually, this is, how we, this is what we think is important, and this is how we want to be represented in data. And I think it's that that's made this such a fantastic um, collaboration. We've had you know, different ways in which we've seen statistics offices and civil society groups in particular coming together since 2015 now to have this conversation at different levels, at national level, sub-national, and of course, as we heard today, um, yesterday in the Statistics Commission at a global level as well. And I think it really shows, and I'd like to really appreciate and sort of recognize the, the openness and the effort on both sides that that has taken um, to make this happen. It hasn't always been an easy journey but, um, but in sort of demonstrating and really recognizing in very specific and operational ways how to work together and the value of this collaboration, I think both sides, you know, both players in this civil citizen generated data story have demonstrated a huge amount of openness, willingness to learn, willingness to try new things. And it's that which has brought us here to this moment where we can really start to think about um, about working together in a new and a, um, and a sort of stronger and more systematic and routinized way. Um, I'd also like to recognize the fantastic work of Francesca and the UN Statistics Division. It's always such a pleasure to collaborate, uh, to collaborate with that fantastic team who brings such commitment and such openness to the, to the work and creativity. And I think this is one of several, uh, this is one of several topics on which we collaborate and it's, it's always a joy. Um, and I hope that you will also experience some of that fun here today. We have, uh, we're going to have um, a panel discussion to start with, um, where we'll be sharing some of the stories of the impact that citizen-generated data can have and the way that collaborations between civil society groups, UN agencies, governments and others can really harness the power of citizen-generated data and the voices of citizens that it represents to deliver policy change, to increase understanding, ultimately to, to help to change people's lives. And we will also be having um, a fun and interactive game. I think that's probably something to do with the cards that you were all given. Exactly, if you don't have a colored card, then my colleague Lizzie there can help you to, uh, can, can give you one, um, in which you have to imagine that you yourself are the citizen. Um, and you are going to be offering your data to help to, uh, to increase understanding. Um, I think that's quite enough for me, just with a huge, once again, huge thanks to all, everybody who brought this together. These are not easy, these look very easy. If we get it right, these look very, very easy and are very, very difficult to organize. So thank you to everybody involved. And let me now hand over to my wonderful colleague, Karen Bett, who has driven so much of this work in our team and is such an inspiration to us all. Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, and uh, thanks, Francesca, for your uh, kind opening remarks. So we'll have a quick panel, uh, about 20, 30 minutes, uh, just to hear from countries uh, and organizations on their work on citizen data and then we'll get to the game, the fun part. So I want to invite uh, Beatrice uh, Piedad from Dane. Um, please, please join me, Beatrice. Uh, Caleb uh, Ephraim from United Belize Advocacy Movement. Caleb, please join us. Eva Herschel uh, from International Land Coalition and Al Kags from the Open Institute. Great, so we'll, uh, we'll have a round of questions and maybe uh, Beatrice, let's start with you because you're closest to me. Um, how has uh, Danny sort of engaged with citizens uh, and of course with civil society for more inclusive data? What has been your experience? Well, Danny has long tradition with that. Uh, just by the 70s, there was the household survey that started then national household survey that we use now daily for unemployment rate. So it was started in the university, Los Andes University, with very a small sample for four cities. And now it's the wide sample that we count on for household survey every day. And a more recent example, we have the LGBTQ uh, population information 
This was a survey that we started by collecting data that voluntarily people fill out for DANE. That happened in the, two years ago. Um, from that poll that we start uh, with uh, citizens providing data on their gender preferences and uh, how, how, who is, who are you attracted to, and filling out information like that, we have started to collect this data that was very taboo in Colombia and very hard to get. Thanks, thank you so much, Beatrice. Maybe I'll come to you, Caleb, and maybe also telling us more about the United Belize advocacy movement. Um, you know, how have you engaged with citizens and why has it been so important and what has been your role? I'm your resident troublemaker back home. That's my role. Um, for, for us, we can have the conversation about collecting data without dismantling legislation that decriminalize um, same-sex intimacy. And of course, that came with protests, that came with resistance, um, all kinds of hostility. But we were able to produce um, data from our human rights observatory, which is the only LGBT-managed human rights observatory in the country, where we, we did, uh, we produced knowledge products around um, gay men being murdered, and as a result, in 2018, we were able to do a forensic profile of a missing child while well, he was 17 years old. And we were able to tell the police where they would find the body parts. And uh, we were able to confirm that the two missing leg, or rather the two legs that they found was that of the 17 year old in 2020. And the mother was able to bury the two legs of her child in October, um, on October 5th, 2020. So for me, data is deeply personal and it's all, it can also be traumatic. On the other side, um, when we look at our human rights observatory, uh, we also translate that into reform, human rights reports at the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, and right now we're working on hate crime legislation and anti-discrimination legislation called the Equal Opportunity Bill. Why did I get involved? Because we had a bunch of straight people telling me how they perceive my community and I'm the one living it. So we had to organize. It's as simple as that. Thank you so much, Caleb, for that. Um, Eva, maybe I could come to you just from the Land Coalition uh, perspective, you know, why do you care about these issues and how have you engaged with citizens on land rights? Yes. Thank you. Um, the International Land Coalition is a, a coalition. We're a group of more than 300 members that are working across 84 countries. Um, and one of our primary areas of work is around people's data, people's data for accountability. Um, we could say citizens' data for impact. Um, and we work with our members to identify data where people are visible, where the populations that we want to see can be seen, and we help them to collect data on the things that they want to measure. So we want to, to democratize, open up, make land monitoring, um, issues of land tenure, land rights, land governance more accessible. We wanted to understand how women were experiencing land governance, how indigenous people were experiencing land governance. And so we've built monitoring systems that allow that data to be seen and to be used. We've then helped our members in, in, in a number of different countries to, to bring that data to decision-making spaces, right? To, to put it on the table, whether it's to guide a conversation and say, this is the data we've collected, this is what it says about the issues that are important to us, um, or whether it's to say, you know, we'd like you to collect data in a way that makes these populations more visible, or here's data that we think you could use and that could actually be adopted, validated, and then used effectively by governments and national statistical offices. So we're looking for those partnerships there 
they're increasingly less and less isolated. The examples we can give of data being used, whether it's attacks on land and environmental defenders, um, an assessment of uh, the legal framework and its ability to provide equal access and control over land to women. Um, we're giving citizens the tools and empowering them to, to use that data to make sure that they feel seen and then engage in, in a conversation. So, it's exciting to, to be here at a time when this conversation seems to be opening and, and there's a mandate to really formalize channels, ways, means, criteria by which this data could, um, could be more and more useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. I'll, uh, I'll just come to you last. Uh, from your experience as the Open Institute, you know, why have you engaged with citizens? Why has it been so important and what has been your role? Well, thank you for giving me an hour to speak about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, um, at the Open Institute, we started working on citizen-generated data in 2015. And the reason why we started working on it was because of the fact that we took seriously the idea of leave no one behind, and we took it literally. And we said, well, if you want to leave no one behind and you want to take that literally, it means that um, a couple of things. One, that if you want to achieve the SDGs, then you must do it at the hyper-local level because it's too difficult and, 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 and um, complex to do it at national level. But then that means that at village level, at hyper-local level, you can count everyone. You can go to every single household and confirm which household doesn't have clean drinking water and provide that. Um, w when you want to provide fertilizer, you don't do it the way national governments currently do it, where in many cases they make an announcement um, that we will be coming to your, to your area, to your region, and we'll be providing uh, fertilizer to all farmers, because what generally happens is that most farmers that actually get the fertilizer tend to be the ones who are, have access to information, are wealthier, have access to transport, and so on and so forth. And the ones who are poorer tend to miss out anyway, simply because of the fact that either they didn't get the information or they just don't have the logistical capacity to go to town. But if you have counted every single home, if I have counted every, if I wanted to give an iPhone to every single person in the room, and I said, you know, raise your hand if you have an iPhone, and uh, Davis raised his hand, and everybody else didn't, I then can walk around the room and give an iPhone to literally everyone because of the fact that everyone has counted, and I have counted everyone. So that's the reason why we started working on citizen-generated data at that level. And we started by going to one village and making sure that um, that village collected the data themselves and they were able to um, you know, identify their needs and priorities and engage with government to say, these are our needs and priorities because of the fact that they had a lot more confidence. After that, we were told that, well, that's a unique situation, so we needed to scale it up. And we scaled it up first to a sub-county, which is a collection of villages, I want to say, or wards. And then later, we have now done it in several counties in Kenya, where we are working with county governments, and they're doing um, citizen-generated data across um, the counties. Um, counties, for purposes of non-Kenyans, is the equivalent of the states um, here in the US. So that's, that's really why we, we are in this, is because of the fact that we think that if we can get everyone to count in some way, then um, development can happen faster and more equitably. Thank you, Al. Um, just coming to you, Beatrice, and maybe just reflecting on what you've heard from civil society, often the challenge we hear when it comes to citizen data is one, the quality, and just sort of uh, how you incorporate that into official reporting, not necessarily making it official, but you know, making it usable uh, for reporting. So what have been some of the challenges? How have you navigated those uh, challenges? Well, there's plenty of challenges in, in this situation. Uh, first, to reach everyone, just like he was saying, it's very hard to reach everyone in a country like Colombia, where you have this mix of huge cities uh, that look very much like big cities in the US, but you also have uh, very small ones, those that are in the Amazons or in the borders where people are usually crossing in between two countries. So it's really hard to reach absolutely everyone uh, just because of logistics, just because of that. Okay. 
and think of places that are far away and depopulated. Uh, we don't even have electricity, so at least to say internet. So even if we have developed very advanced tools to collect the data or internet, uh, to fill out a form, or it's really hard to get to th uh, that part of the country. So we will always have this challenge, but we know that, and then we need to just address that and um, figure new ways to do that. So uh, the, pandem the pandemic was actually an opportunity for that. It's written in the manuals and everywhere that you do not uh, fill out surveys by calling people over cell phones, even less. But uh, during the pandemic, we had the chance to do that because we had to, we had no other choice. And that has gave us an opportunity to explore these ways. So that's something that uh, at Dane we're exploring at this moment and trying to bend the rules a, a little bit and, and see how we get to reach more people farther uh, other than in the big cities and wherever we can easily go or do our typical job. So that's, that's one way to do it and we'll, we are exploring other ways to do that as well. Great, thank you. Um, Caleb, just coming to you and um, reflecting on what Beatrice has said around access and the challenges of, of connecting with citizens. Of course, civil society have closer access. What has been your engagement interactions with the NSO for one or with government, but also the new way of working for citizen data, of course, is collaboration. So how has been your collaboration with other partners in Belize? Well, let me talk by acknowledging my colleague, Phil Creehan, who has been dragging me, kicking and screaming into this issue of working with Statistical Institute. Um, <laughs> so if you, see him, if you see him missing, know that I'm responsible. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, so I first started with um, working with him uh, in a 12th country report for the Caribbean and he was smart enough to strategize around what would be the approach to collect data on the ground. And we, we had gone back and forth for months uh, figuring out what that was. And then we produced a 12, the, the Open for Business produced a 12 country report for which I'm now working with him to produce a report for Belize, a socioeconomic analysis. That's something our statistical institute would have never thought of because we don't exist as producers and consumers of goods and services. We don't exist in the unemployment um, statistics or the, the impact of inflation or the business enterprise evaluation. We don't exist. Uh, we barely exist as citizens with civil rights. And so um, it's clear to me, to working with him, that a community-driven approach is critical. And so he and I, again, he dragged me kicking and screaming on many Zoom calls. I've had so many Zoom calls, I have quite a few screenshots of those meetings. And, and through that, we were able to raise a lot of money to do an LGBTI wrong table, regional wrong table, around what communities believe are important to them. It was the first round table for the Caribbean, and I love the fact that because we were vested, that we shape the way the agenda happened, and we decided what the direction was. Now, out of that came six or seven advocacy strategies, seven, um, 13 policy action and legislative action, and we decided that we would do a, a national model of what that would look like. So we started engaging uh, the Ministry of Economic Development, the Ministry of Finance, the SIB folks, and we started to tell them, hey, you have an opportunity. And this is a two-year process. Uh, and so I'm in it for the long haul because at the end of the day, I need to stay to know that I exist with arms and legs. And, but it's not just for me, but it's also for a small economy like Belize, which is only 1.9 billion. I'm sure that's a drop in the bucket for any one of your economies, wherever you are. And, and so for me, it's important to advance our our human capital value as citizens, but it's also important for us as citizens to understand ourselves because we don't live single issues. 
or single identity lives of citizen. You're man, you're woman, you're gay, you're straight, you're disabled, you're old, you're young. Uh, and so if you look at all those various angles, it's important for us to shape the, 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 the profile of what we look like and not just wait for the state um, to do it for us because we know why it matters to us as citizens. So I hope you do not come to this meeting kicking and screaming. <laughs> 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 You're a convert now. <laughs> um, Eva, maybe just reflecting also on the land coalitions, who have you been pulling into the uh, conversation, but also have you interacted with the NSOs? Of course, the coalition is uh, bigger than just one country, but maybe reflecting on uh, country examples of your members. Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of, of examples, and, and I think that in each of the cases, it's, it's been really a trust-building exercise. Um, we're, we're, we're supporting members who are approaching NSOs, that are approaching governments that are of different levels of readiness and openness to have this conversation, right? So. Um, I think it's it's been a bit of both sides needing to recognize the value that each of them brings to the table, um, that our members are often measuring things that NSOs are unable to and that NSOs have escape, uh, you know, a, a scope, a reach, and, um, you know, a legitimacy in a space that, that can, they can also learn from. So, um, yeah, the, 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 there are a number of examples I could draw from, I guess. In, in Kenya, we've had a positive example of um, two members, um, both working through MOUs uh, with the NSO, one on land and environmental defenders, data um, on citizen-generated uh, data on attacks against them. So again, the advantage here with citizen-generated data is that our members are close to the ground, they're quickly collecting data, they're understanding when attacks are happening, non-lethal attacks, they're not only counting assassinations, right? They're looking at threats, they're looking at harassment, um, criminalization cases, and they're able to track this quickly in a way that an NSO machinery would, would take time to capture. So the NSO there has been open. It's been working with the National Institute for Human Rights, which has a mandate to work with and, and to work with CSOs on this. So we're seeing MOUs and precedents there where the NSO working with a human rights body has together recognize the value of citizen-generated data, um, and they've advanced in a lot of ways to set criteria by which citizen-generated data would be considered, and in that sense, it's become a two-way street. Like, we recognize the value of citizen-generated data. We also recognize that it has limitations and challenges. Let's work together to improve the quality, to improve the legitimacy of that data. Um, also, in, in the Philippines, we've had members who are gathering data on land conflict, and they've been invited to form part of an SDG chamber on, on citizen-generated data by which this information is presented, it's considered, and they have an opportunity, um, as Beatrice was saying, um, to influence concepts. And what do we mean by land tenure? We need to speak to diverse stakeholders if we're going to get the concepts right, if they're going to be inclusive enough, and then we're going to build data collection systems ca that can reflect that complexity, right? So maybe their data won't be considered, but that's not the only victory we can count, right? Them being at the table and influencing concepts, terminologies, making sure that they see themselves in the way the data is being collected. So um, there are other examples, but those are two I could mention. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Al, uh, just coming to you, what has been your interaction with the NSO and working with partners uh, on this topic? Um, so I think I think one of the things that, um, in my reflections about a citizen generated citizen generated data, um, especially this week, has been that we're in a moment where um, innovation um, it's a moment of innovation in terms of how um, data comes into the national statistical system or comes into um, country statistical systems. Um, because of the fact that there's a recognition of the fact that the NSO does not have the capacity to do everything. 
in Kenya, we are, we are excited because of the fact that our NSO um, is very energized. The KNBS has been very energized to work together with civil society organizations. Um, and in fact, um, just literally three weeks ago or so, um, we, have, we have come a long way. Um, about a year or so ago, they, they published together with GPSDD um, guidelines on citizen-generated data um, that um, begin to address those issues of quality, address those issues of timeliness and so on um, that, that worry people and that begin to tell um, you know, people in civil society or in citizen groups, if you, your data is valid um, for you, but for it to be valid for everybody else, these are the various um, sort of criteria that we can use. Um, but in essence, there's a recognition that citizen-generated data is valid period, just for the people who are going to be using it. Um, because sometimes it is not about, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a real example. We started working with um, artisanal small-scale miners in Kenya, and we tried to figure out how many they are, because of the fact that they live in such deplorable uh, circumstances. And part of the problem was that they didn't have a lobby. They don't have a lobby of their own where they can actually go to government as a group and say, listen, these are our issues in terms of safety. These are our issues in terms of uh, production and, and you know how revenues and so on and so forth. So we tried to figure out how many they are. And what was interesting is that um, there have been a couple of surveys done by uh, consultants on behalf of the World Bank, on behalf of the UN and several others. but the statistics that all of these different um, uh, organizations have are different. So in one you hear 3,000, in another you hear 8,000, in another you hear 10,000. And you ask yourself, well, but surely you can count these people, they're not that many. And so we set out to try and figure out how we can do that. We went to um, four counties, the four main mining counties, and we worked with civil society organi uh, organizations that are in those counties to try and figure out how to just count the people who are there. And it turned out that, A, miners don't move very much um, from one place to another. They tend to stay in the, in the area. So it is actually possible for us to count. Certainly in Taita, now we came up with, a, with an actual number. It wasn't a percentage. Um, it was an actual number. Um, and it was disaggregated. It could tell you how many women there are, how many men there are, and how many um, young uh, people there are um, because of the fact that you could do it by demographic. And because of the fact that there were about um, 2,800 thereabouts um, in Taita, it means that it is actually possible to, for that group to collect data on a regular basis. But here's why I'm saying that data is valid, period. Those 2,800 people in Taita were able to recognize that they strength in numbers and that they could begin to have they are a constituency that is valid. A lot of times when they're working in their minds, it is, you know, you, c you can almost look like you have tunnel vision, that, like there's only you and the five, 10 people who are in your mind. But the moment you begin to recognize that there's numbers and there's a constituency among us, then you can begin to, um, to speak up. The final thing I'd say is this. Um, I applaud the Kenyan National Bureau of Statistics because of the fact that now it is working with um, CSOs and some of these other groups to try and make sure that there's a technical working group that is multi-sectoral to um, go further than just having guidelines, but to go further to figure out what are the ways that um, the NSO could actually market um, citizen-generated data as a concept and bring that data into the national statistical system so that even if it is not being reported for the traditional purposes, you know, economic survey, household service, and so on and so forth. It can still be used to provide context, to provide nuance um, to how development is done in countries. And we found that that is, you know, that's real value, and that's a, a real um, uh, progress. Um, I think I would take this moment to actually um, acknowledge GPSDD, because in the la even in the years of the pandemic, um, you know, Karen and Davis and We've seen you, you know, continually pushing um, this agenda and making sure that, uh, well, there was death by Zoom, but at least things were happening um, <laughs> even during the pandemic um, to keep this issue alive and to keep it moving. Um, because where we are now, um, at least in Kenya, is in such a place where um, we can 
confidently say that there's a real collaboration between the government and um, civil society and citizen groups, and B, um, uh, that there is m a stronger recognition within government that citizen-generated data has a place um, within the development cycle of the country. Thank you so much, Al. I know we're running out of time, so I have just one quick question for you all, 30 seconds each, uh, if possible. Like, What's the one thing, one lesson that you'd like to share to uh, all the people in this meeting? Well, I think collaboration is just what I want to say about this. We all need this. And when I say we, is we as a society, not we as NSO or statistical producers, because the NSO can provide or can uh, teach how to do this, can teach to the society how we collect this uh, with uh, all the manuals that we have and with all the knowledge that we have, and then we have great statistics on all these topics that we need. Uh, there's plenty of exercises like that in Colombia. We have the, the peace process, and then we have this, uh, all this data from human rights violations that is being collected by the special jurisdiction for the peace process. We have the LGBTQ experience. We have a native Colombians experience. We are creating the first uh, statistical system for an ethnic particular group in Colombia. They are called the Canquamos and so on and so forth. But we need to collaborate. It's really important uh, to have these technical skills. We can teach that to, to these groups in the society and then it will come back to us and then we will have the official numbers and then it goes on and on and on. So I think it's really, really important to have this collaboration process. Hello. For me, no is not an answer. No money is not an answer. It's only me, it's not an answer. It's a marginalized population, so we can't do it, it's not an answer. If I pay millions of dollars as a taxpayer into the state, I expect the same access to service. And so I say no taxation without representation, and in that regard, the state has a responsibility to make sure I am included. I don't talk to me about leaving no one behind because I'm attached to you by my umbilical card to whatever you're doing. So you're not leaving me behind. I'm letting you know. Demand-driven approach is essential. Thank you, Caleb. Eva. I think we need to stay this path and celebrate the victories, these moments where we see successful collaborations, document them, document the way these things work and share those experiences, show that it's possible when these precedents are set. I think as this recognition for community-driven data, community-generated data becomes more and more established, let's make sure we're resourcing that data. Let's make it possible, let's provide learning, capacity building, and and make sure that if this is data we want, if we recognize that these approaches are capturing data we need, we need to make it sustainable for them to keep contributing the data that we want. Thank you. Al. I think for me the, the big thing that I'd like to say is this. We are at a moment when we must recognize that citizen-generated data is not an intellectual ex exercise. It's not purely an intellectual exercise. It's about human beings. There are human beings in this world that are invisible. Caleb is talking about some of them, but there are people in rural and remote parts of our, of our world that are just not counted. They don't have mobile phones, they don't have electricity, and so on and so forth, but even government does not recognize that those people don't exist. And they actually don't exist because of the fact that um, they're where I live, I live in a, in a town, in a, in a rural town. And it's a, it's a cosmopolitan town called Malindi in, in Kenya. Two hours away, just driving two hours away, I meet people who have never seen a shower. I meet people who have never actually experienced a bank or a supermarket or a normal shop, apart from the little kiosk that is in their place and they have no use for a bank because they don't have identification. And the only reason they don't have identification is because 
it costs too much to go to town to go get their identification. These people are invisible. And they've been left, f we've, been in, we've had our independence for almost 60 years, but what is interesting is that these people have been left behind for all of this time. It's 2023, and there's people who have never had a shower, who have never seen running water in their homes. And the reason for this is because they are not counted. Citizen-generated data provides us with the opportunity to actually make all these people count. When the SDG's motto is leave no one behind, let's just take it literally. We can leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I had a very powerful panel. Uh, I'm so inspired uh, by all your interventions. We have about five minutes uh, just for any reactions on the floor, any questions before I had. All right. <laughs> So we have some roving mics uh, there. So we can start with you, Nicholas, um, Jessa, Shada, then maybe we can do a second round. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's a, just a big, big thank you that I want to say. I think you made my day. And more than that, I am from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I was involved in the, uh, in the first discussion between the Statistical Office and the Human Rights Commission. We brought them together in a room outside Nairobi so that they would uh, speak together. And uh, one side would say, oh, we will never be able to work with the other side. Those people of the human rights, they're good at shouting. This is only what they do. And uh, the, the human rights colleagues were saying the statistician, oh, those statisticians, I mean, they just provide statistics that we don't need, which is not relevant. So we will never be able to work with them. This is how it started. And uh, the, uh, an agreement, an MOU, and uh, uh, and, and things. So I, I, I won't go. We, we, we. Uh, I mentioned just there the UN Statistical Commission. Eleven countries that signed those MOU. It can be without MOU we, if people are willing to work together. But there is a model MOU that uh, developed by the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We so tiny that I don't want to mention how big we are. But the big is you, so it's, it's great that uh, you, 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 what you are doing and the NSOs are, are, are doing, taking the lead. So really a big, big thank you. Uh, so, such a happy to, to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Jessamine Garnashan from Young Women. And thank you to the speakers for such powerful, inspiring, and actionable messages. Uh, thank you for starting this my morning like this. So I think um, my first, I'll... I don't have an iPhone. Do I get an iPhone? <laughs> and no, just mainly a comment. I think with CGD, there's no doubt it's useful, it's relevant. And I think what has always been like, you know, almost been like a broken record is more of the quality that is being like, you know, that is being raised, which is always a constraint for, for NSOs. But I think we also should remind ourselves that, you know, NSOs, Often they are expected to produce official statistics for general purpose statistics, but citizen generated data, it's for targeted, focused, programmatic actions. And I think that's where ministries, departments, agencies can really play a big role because they need program data. They need data that are for specific subpopulations, for specific geographical location. And um, I think I'm just driving the point that, you know, with the partnership with NSO, it's not my, my view, it's not really on direct co-production of official statistics, but really NSO's role as a coordinator of the statistical system to open the doors for ministry, for, uh, for citizen-generated data to be used by other ministries, departments, and agencies. Many of this, they use data from academic research, from pilot studies. As you said, Al, this is not just merely an intellectual exercise. This is something that, you know, that speaks of the voice from the citizen. So I hear you loud and clear on that, but I think moving forward, we have to have like, you know, clear intentionality on the role of NSOs, not mainly as, co as, as you know, co-producer of official statistics, but rather as coordinator of the statistical system to open the doors for uh, citizen engagement. So thank you. And just on your point, Caleb, uh, on not, uh, I'm not leaving you behind. I think that's one powerful message that, you know, we always say leaving no one behind. And it's almost like 
again, we're looking at citizens or others in a passive, in a passive role. But if we say that, you know, it's coming from a voice of the citizens that I'm not leaving you behind, that, you know, I'm, you, there's no, you know, not behind, you know, but there's no getting away from me. So thank you. There's no getting away from me. <laughs> Shada Badi from Open Data Watch. And again, also very, very much thank you to all the speakers. It's been very, very good panel and inspiring. Most of the stories that you're talking about is very powerful, but it's coming from context where you have a democratic society at the base of it, relatively democratic societies. My question is that the power of CGD is really beyond that. And we have many countries, many citizens. I come from one of those countries, Iran, where the voice of the people, the voice of the women, has not been reflected in data in that way. So let's, and I, I don't expect an answer, but if you have one, Al and, and colleagues, please. But let's sort of use the power of CGD also to create those uh, opportunities for building more democratic societies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we could get a quick reaction, and then I know we have a colleague from Philippines, uh, and I see Monica. You uh, have the now, mic. may I say something? Okay. okay. Maybe let's just do one okay. quick response, and then you'll come after Philippines. Anyone wants to react to the first? I think the first two were more of comments and sentiments uh, and appreciation. There's also Shader's question on democratization. So maybe if anyone wants to react to the three. Well, I have a thing for Iran. Um, so so the, the fighting spirit of the women in Iran grabs me every time I see it on TikTok. It's TikTok. Um, and, and back home we see, well, I can see as a gay man, Iranian women have more balls than I do. <laughs> uh, and, and so, and so even though I can't do anything about the experiences of Iranian women, I know I can do something about Belizean women and addressing the needs of dismantling practices of systemic and structural oppression. So uh, I march on with no bullshit in my work. That's my answer to you. Uh, I was having a conversation recently with somebody else from Iran um, about the opportunities for Citizen United Data and the, and the biggest thing that I learned there um, from this person was that if, if the women are already finding ways to organize, to make sure that their voices are being heard using their diaspora, using TikTok, using very innovative ways, um, there's a real opportunity for them to just count each other in their, however their small areas are, just count and say, um, in this community we are 15, 20, 30, 300, 500 women who are denied these services, who are denied, who are being oppressed in this way. And there's an opportunity for the diaspora um, to sort of receive um, that citizen genetic data and map it out. Um, and um, when we were talking about it and, and, and we were trying to think about how that would be done, we said, well, I don't know to what extent that the Iranian diaspora is organized, but maybe, I mean, Open Data Watch is a, is a great home for this, that there can be a platform to which data is sent from inside Iran um, via whichever means people are communicating, because people are communicating and just make sure that there's numbers that are coming out to say that in this place, there's 350 women, in that place, there's 750 women, and so on and so forth. And that sort of comes alive on a map, um, and it's a really um, powerful tool. Great. Um, half a second. Okay. <laughs> I know I was just going to quickly respond and say, yes, that I, I agree in what Al is saying about citizen-generated data being also an act of empowerment, an act of resistance. We recently undertook a data collection exercise in Nicaragua, and there were a number of precautions we, need to, we needed to take there with the people we were collecting data with that we wouldn't 
have had to even consider in other countries, but they organized and it served as a means by which they documented their own experience of that moment, right? So then they had this body of evidence um, they had this data set that they couldn't put their names to, right? They couldn't, we, we had to treat it differently, but that it had also been extremely important because of the conditions in which that data was being collected. Great, thank you. So just two quick ones uh, from Monica and then from Philippines. I think we have Philippines. Yes, just quick reaction from your experience and then Monica and then we... Uh, so I'm Christine Briones uh, from the Philippine Statistics Authority, the National Statistics Office of the Philippines. Uh, so I was just asked this morning to say something. Uh, well, I, I am heading the community-based monitoring system. So this is the response of uh, the Philippine government of the need for local level data for po poverty targeting. So at the moment, the Philippines have 1,600 cities and municipalities, and we're conducting the CBMS in almost 700 cities and municipalities in the country. So the CBMS collects data, it's census type, so we go all over the city, collect data from the households and the individuals. So as mentioned by Al, uh, the main purpose here is for uh, not leaving anyone behind. Uh, for the Philippines, uh, one of the main objectives of the CBMS is to empower the local community. So we recognize that uh, the National Statistics Office cannot do everything and cannot collect everything. So what we do is to teach the local government on how to collect their data and how to use the, their data. And also we are now collaborating with the different uh, departments. So uh, we, ha we now have an open communication from our health department our education department so that they can also use uh, the data for their own purpose. So we also are uh, communicating now with uh, different agencies and also uh, private institutions because we know that uh, we don't have the enough expertise on specific uh, topics, particularly on climate change and uh, risk tar targeting. And we know that uh, the academe in the Philippines have enough data for this. So what we will do is to merge the data, give it to the local government so that they can uh, target their own beneficiaries, conduct their own programs, develop their own programs. So I'm also glad that I, am, I know now for uh, CGD uh, uh, individuals who can also help us. So I'm looking forward also to speaking with the four of you so that we could collaborate and probably use uh, the data that you're collecting and merge it with the CBMS in order to empower our local communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Monica, did you want to? Uh, uh, yes, very quickly. Um, first of all, thanks. A big and huge thanks. But I would like to, to pass from theory to practice. And uh, I would like also not to identify this movement towards citizen-generated data as a movement to protect minorities, because we, we must take into account that respondent rates are going down and down. And this means something. So it is not only a matter of mm, making visible invisible part of the population, but also uh, making visible what is going to become invisible. Mm? Um, I wouldn't like a, a, a world where uh, the national statistical offices are uh, giving messages, data, information, but they are only giving a, a sort of tautologic message. So they are replicating schemes, uh, old schemes, uh, old uh, ideas of society. We need to use this fact that respondent rates are decaying and are going down and down as a sort of uh, leverage to change the idea of respondents in quotes. And so it is an engagement of civil society, but we, we need not to identify the issue as a matter of making visible what is invisible, but as a matter of improving the general data collection. Uh, that's 
from my side now. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, how are you standing next to me? Because we need to move to the next session. But I just want to thank my panel. Uh, thank you so much for your interventions and thank you for your uh, you know, examples, your, pr your best practices. So maybe we can give a round of applause to my panel and then over to you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's, it, was, it wasn't me who pushed Karen. It, it was Papa. <laughs> I need to leave five minutes to Papa to close. And also, um, when we tried to entice people to come to the event, we said it's breakfast and game. And so we've seen breakfast really wonderful. We haven't seen the game part, so we really had to get it going. So <laughs> I know. Um, so basically, uh, we would like to have, you've all received the cards. So. Uh, gather two or three of you who you do not have, make sure you don't have the same color. And just really going, you don't have to talk about, cover all the five questions, but one or two or pick a few that you would like to cover and discuss with your small groups. The place is so nice and spacious. You can also stand up and talk to other colleagues. So we've seen a lot going on and just reflect on it. And then you will have 10 minutes and then, <laughs> and then we'll call a few colleagues to, to share with your uh, discussion what you have learned in your, dis uh, in, your, in your discussion. And we will also have a slide though to collect the key messages from you. So 10 minutes, I'll have alarm on. Thank you. No, <laughs> talk, it, talk to someone who you do not know each other, like Francesca and Claire. <laughs> Don't sit together, and Papa, <laughs> you know each other.
One more minute, one more minute.
Hello. Is there a button I can press? So, uh, like. Hello. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My colleagues over there. Can we ask thank you? Sorry for it's only 10 minutes, but I've seen a lot of discussion on go. Yes, we can have another five hours. <laughs> but after this, you can continue the discussion uh, for five hours. So given the time, we are only f six minutes before the end of the allocated time that there is a statistical commission formal session will start in at 10 o'clock. So I wouldn't stop anyone from um, moving towards that conference room four. Uh, just if I can invite two colleagues to reflect on key messages you got in your discussion. And then we have a slide though for everyone to put your word there and it will be saved. Two colleagues. Raise your hand. Ah, yes. Yes, our UK colleagues, please. Paula. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Paula McLeod from the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We've had a fabulous discussion after a brilliant panel session. So thank you so much to everyone, and it's been great to be here. Um, when we talked about first impressions, it's, sort of, it's interesting that the journey we take um, like, you know, citizen, you know, inclusive data is friendly, it's beneficial. Um, I was also saying it's essential, but you have to be bold. We have to recognize that to be inclusive, we have to ask the difficult questions. We can't shy away from what's in that space. Um, and we talked about, you know, that process, the inclusive dialogue that sits from the start of creating inclusive processes that are truly participatory, that bring in the voice of all citizens. And that, again, speaks to that friendly, beneficial journey. Um, but we sort of, when we come to points two and three about how we get this used and the biggest challenges, is that the official statistical system is brilliant, but it's like an oil tanker. It moves and it's solid and we know where it's going. Citizen-generated data has that ability to be agile, to make sure we talked about statistics being where we have that window, that transparent window on the issues of the moment, that agility that comes from the citizen-generated data, make sure it's pointing in the right direction, is in the right sides, but it has to remain trustworthy. You have to have that rigor that comes from code of practice, from the fundamental principles that ensures that we communicate well, that it, it can be bought in and trusted within that decision-making process. And that's where we have to be inclusive as a community, to not say we have very staged, trusted regulation. We have to make sure that it's something that speaks to the whole of society. Um, so yeah, we're sort of, we're thinking it's that magic source where if we can build on that good principle that comes from the code and how we demonstrate trustworthiness in our data collection, what good practice looks like, we can truly leverage what is an absolutely essential resource for um, having the relevant data we need. Thanks. Thank you so much. So I heard trust, sharing more experiences, I, and then I'm referring to the collaborative that we're, and, and uh, moving forward by doing, started working on it. Any other? Uh, I, th I think um, I won't summarize our whole discussion, um, but I think I would add sort of NSO accountability and meaning to that list of words. Um, I think citizen gen we talked about how citizen-generated data, it, it is a voice for those who aren't seen, but part of the reason the NSO um, is having respondent issues or other troubles is that the products of their labor are not resulting in meaningful information back to the, society, to the citizens who are mm -hmm. contributing sort of through those mm -hmm. official lines sometimes. So if citizens are bringing their own voices to the process and the NSO is open to hearing them, they can adjust their practices um, so that the kind of information that's shared across all areas is more meaningful. 
um, and we have better capacity to act on it. Thank you, Laura. Now I'm, I know, I'd like to look at my co-chair and to get his approval whether <laughs> we can take more questions or more feedbacks. Now it's 9.28. Yes, so um, now I'm sorry, we can continue the conversation, but there is, while we have things ongoing, put your, if there's one word, one, the key message you would like to have saved, please use the Slido. Now I'd like to give the floor to Papa to close the event. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Howie. And uh, uh, really, I, you know, the panelists and uh, really, I think, excellent conversations. Uh, let me just uh, start by saying, you know, um, you know, this work is extremely rewarding, as I think you can all see. It's really interesting, interesting discussions. So if you would like to join the collaborative, you know, please uh, contact Howie and uh, we'd be happy to, to, to really, you know, again, uh, welcome you in, in this work. It's, uh, you know, I think the key word here is collaboration. So just, I think, a, a few uh, reflections uh, from me when it comes to uh, what we've heard. Uh, Francesca started by telling us about the mandate that we received from, from the Statistical Commission. And you know, this is not a small thing, right? This is a mandate to work on a challenging topic from a very, very conservative community, right? So, and I think we should definitely uh, um, leverage that and, 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 and continue, uh, continue uh, with this work. But also, you know, I think today, just from the examples today, but also from the Friday seminar uh, from, uh, you know, the uh, expert group in Bangkok, we also know that, you know, uh, the work on citizen engagement. So I think we here we talk about citizen engagement, not just citizen generated data. Uh, basically, this work comes from very many different angles, right? So a lot of diversity, it's a pluralistic agenda, as it should be, right? So, you know, we've heard it from different levels, so micro, meso, uh, macro in some cases. And, you know, but also uh, another point is, you know, and, uh, you know, the past few days also we've been discussing other important agendas, like, you know, administrative data or you know, big data and, and, and so on. So you know, how do you bring in the private sector and so on. So I think there's really lots of different agendas that, that do, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, come together. And you put this together also, at least for me, you know, it does point to one factor, which is that we have to do this through partnerships, right? So NSOs are essential actors, but they are not and they shouldn't be, I think, the gatekeepers when it comes to this work, right? Because, again, they will never have the capacity to assess and validate all CGD, all citizen-generated data. In, in some cases, we actually don't want them to because, you know, citizens can play a crucial monitoring role that should be independent of government. So, you know, I think um, from there, I think, you know, again, partnerships to develop a framework to understand and define the scope of what we are talking about uh, you know, uh, and uh, this, I think, will really be, you know, uh, the starting point of what will help us advance this agenda. Uh, understanding, basically, what is the value added at each stage. Um, it is crucial, I think, that we learn from what currently exists. Uh, so the work that has been done in this area, you know, there are several NSOs, for example, that have developed, started developing frameworks, at least, that we can learn from. But there are also, I think, you know, we heard from the Philippines, for instance, on, you know, years of doing this work, years of monitoring that we should learn from and really not start from scratch and understand basically what are some of those basic elements that will go into a framework. And I think if we do that, we will be, you know, we can really start to make a headway in this area and really, you know, again, approach it in the spirit of collaboration and partnership. And uh, for me, I think that those are some of the essential elements. So again, Please join the collaborative uh, if you want to, and uh, we'd be happy to work with you. Thank you very much.